chapter 2, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all mankind. Later on it says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. And so, dear fathers, we give thanks for the life of Queen Elizabeth II. We bring before you our new king, King Charles III. <coughs> and also we pray for all those in authority. And we pray from the words of Isaiah chapter 11. We pray that they may have a, an including uh, new king, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and of right, spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and that he will delight in the Lord. So dear Father, we pray this for him, King Charles, we pray for our country, we acknowledge that our country over the past uh, decades has turned in many ways from light to darkness because men and women prefer darkness rather than light. But we pray that as a nation we may turn towards the light of the Lord Jesus Christ and know the truth of the Saviour. Father, we pray for our own church and our world. As we pray for the world, we think of the, where there is great conflict we remember those who are living in Ukraine under the shadow of war and the developments of that war. We pray for peace, not only in that part of the world, but for so many other places too. We pray for peace in nations, we pray for peace in towns, we pray for peace on the streets, and we pray for peace in our homes and in our families. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Chapter 3, verse 14, moving on into chapter 4. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers saying what their itching ears want to hear. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Good morning again, and morning. Uh, it's great to be with you back in the again. Um, so, if you weren't here last week, uh, and you've not seen me before, I'm, my name is Steve Parker, I live in Chesterfield, um, and uh, yes, if you want to know any more, come and chat to me afterwards. Um, yeah, what a week it's been. Um, new monarch, new prime minister, unprecedented times. <coughs> um, and it's going to be very interesting, I think, in the coming days, weeks and months, as, as, as our nation debates things like, you know, why do we function the way we do? Why are we a constitutional monarchy? Why do we have a king? And, and why is it all tied up with religion and faith and the church? You know, for our secular Britain, you know, these are going to be very provocative interesting times I think and I think that it gives us an opportunity as Christians 
to actually engage with this uh, debate uh, to talk about faith. So I think there's a bit of an open door there. I think people are going to be talking about um, the role of faith in, in life. So that's an opportunity for us. So and that's partly why we're doing this series. We're, we're looking at, um, we're doing apologetics. We're, we're giving reasons for our hope, we're trying to explain why the Christian faith is reasonable um, and rational. So the last time we asked the question, is anyone there? Does God exist? And we saw, yes, there is strong evidence that points to the existence of God. But I finished by saying that the most important uh, or the best way to address that question is to focus on Jesus because he claimed to be God. Uh, and if he is who he says he was, then that answers that question as to whether there is a God. But here's the issue. Almost all of our information about Jesus comes from the Bible, from the four Gospels in particular. And thank you to Gordon, who's already prepared the ground a little bit uh, for what I'm going to say this morning. Can we trust the Bible? Does it record reliable history? Because if not, then we can't be sure about Jesus. That's why we need to have confidence in our source document. Does it give us a reliable picture of the Jesus of history? Now one answer to the question is to say, well of course it's reliable. Of course we can trust the Bible. It's the word of God and God doesn't lie. That's the theological answer uh, and I completely agree with that statement. But it is a statement of faith. It is something only Christians can say that they believe the Bible is the Word of God. That's enough for me. It, it means it's trustworthy and it has authority <coughs> because it's God's Word. And in the midweek study, I've been thinking about the passage that we've just read, thinking about the nature of the Bible, what, what actually is it, what, what, what's, uh, what does it mean to say that it's inspired, and thinking about those kind of questions, and also what role does it play in the Christian life. Now, I'd love to talk about that. Uh, but that's not what my focus will be this morning. This morning I really want to address the person who, who is sceptical, who doesn't accept that the Bible is the Word of God. I think if you ask most people on the street, they'd say, oh, it's a collection of stories, legends, myths that have been handed down. It's on the par with Middle Earth in Lord of the Rings, or it's speaking about a galaxy far, far away. Uh, as in the Star Wars films. Is the Bible a collection of myths or does it connect with history in a meaningful way? And this isn't a recent issue, the fact is the Bible is under attack and has been for centuries. Just three examples at a scholarly level um, and at a popular level. In, I'm going to focus mainly on the New Testament today, which some of the times talked about the whole Bible, um, but in New Testament scholarship, uh, the critical approach that emerged in the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, liberal critical scholarship, really assumed that uh, the Bible uh, cannot be trusted, the Gospels are not reliable history, uh, that they've just been the product of uh, oral tradition, stories that have been handed down and corrupted or adapted over time to suit the needs of particular um, church communities. And so in, in scholarship, what began was the search for the historical Jesus. Can we get behind the Gospels to find the real Jesus? And so for 200 years, this is what um, liberal scholars were obsessed with, as to how can you get behind the text to find the real Jesus? rather than accepting it at face value. The, the assumption was the truth is hidden behind there. We can't trust uh, what is actually on the page. Uh, as I say, that, this, that approach dominated biblical studies for a couple of hundred years, but I'm glad to say now that consensus has, has largely been rejected. Um, but you do still come across extreme scepticism in some quarters. I, I mentioned earlier the Jesus Seminar. Uh, which began in the 1980s, and I'm not even sure it might still be going today. But basically these scholars <coughs> met together regularly to decide which parts of the Gospels were authentic, and they'd go through each word, each verse, 
and they vote with little cards, say so whether they think it's um, completely believable or maybe something Jesus said or definitely something Jesus couldn't have said. And uh, they did this by voting and concluded in the end that 18%, 1-8% of what we have in Gospels can be trusted as reliable and the rest of it we, uh, we had to um, be sceptical about. And then at a popular level, I don't know if you're familiar with the book The Da Vinci Code, written by Dan Brown, I think I've got the date on there, it was 2003, The Da Vinci Code came out, but it was too late to uh, edit the, uh, the PowerPoint. Um, 2003, <coughs> uh, Dan Brown wrote that novel, The Da Vinci Code. How many people read The Da Vinci Code? Yeah, one or two. Uh, it was very popular um, and uh, lots of people read it. And then it's made into a film starring Tom Hanks. Um, but it basically presents a different view of Jesus to the one we find in the Gospels. Uh, supposedly based on the alternative Gospels of Philip, Mary and Thomas. And uh, the book claims that the real truth about Jesus was suppressed. Uh, Jesus actually married Mary Magdalene. Uh, they had children together. Uh, and that this truth was um, suppressed by the Catholic Church and there's, there's been some massive conspiracy and lots of people believe that um, and uh, that have kind of absorbed that, that kind of thinking uh, partly because it's a conspiracy theory and people love conspiracy theories don't they uh, so we need to know how to respond to, to these kinds of questions and issues and I think it's helpful for us to know how did the New Testament come about? How did we get the Bible? So, just want to address that a bit. First, I'm going to talk about the transmission process. How did we get what we have today? Uh, and then talk about the canon, which is the rule of faith. Why is it that we have some things included and other things were not included? Okay, so let me just speak briefly on those matters. Well, of course, it all starts with Jesus. Uh, he lived and died before anything was written down uh, and as, as God reminded us we know that he existed from sources outside the Bible Roman and Jewish historians refer to a man called Jesus he was the founder of the Christian faith he's not a legend he really lived in history uh, he died around the year 1830 give or take a few years and for the next 20 years or so following um, his resurrection um, the message of Jesus was preached and taught as his followers, the, the apostles, travelled around planting and growing churches. Uh, and the key thing is that these were people who were eyewitnesses. They lived with Jesus, they saw, they touched, they experienced firsthand um, everything Jesus said and did. The earliest writings actually are not the Gospels, they are Paul's letters. Galatians is probably the earliest, written in the middle of the first century. And some critics will say that Paul changed the original message of Jesus and, and that Paul is actually the founder of Christianity. But this is not the case because Paul frequently refers to the Gospel he received. He didn't invent it, he received it. He speaks about a tradition that was handed down to him. Um, and so this body of truth was already in existence from the earliest times. In his letter to the Philippians, written in the late 50s, he quotes a hymn to Christ, which reveals that Jesus was already being worshipped as God. It wasn't something added in later, this was part of the very earliest preaching of the Apostles. But then we come to the mid-60s, maybe 30 years after Jesus had died and ascended back to heaven. The apostles were starting to die off. So the need was for a method of communicating the gospel in a post-apostolic age. How are people going to hear about this Jesus when the original eyewitnesses are no more? So that is why the gospels are written, four of them. For different audiences in different places. Mark is the earliest. We know don't know much about Mark, but church tradition has always maintained that Mark's gospel is based on Peter's memoirs. What you have in Mark is 
the really the authoritative uh, memories of Peter. And that makes a lot of sense given the prominence of Peter in Mark's Gospel. So Mark connects us with one of the closest followers and eyewitnesses of Jesus. And then Matthew and Luke, they very much follow Mark in their, the way they structure their Gospels. And then John writes a little bit later um, and takes a slightly different approach. But both Matthew and John were followers of Jesus, they are members of the inner circle as it were. Luke had not been one of the uh, original uh, twelve, um, he was a companion of Paul and uh, he was with him on many of his missionary travels. And Luke tells us at the start of his gospel that uh, he's done a lot of investigation um, and he's interviewed key people including Mary. Mary is very prominent in Luke's Gospel and I believe Luke spoke to Mary and got it first hand from <coughs> her. So no, we're not talking about a long chain of things being handed down. We're talking about direct links with people who were there. Um, so all the Gospels connect us with people who had been at the heart of everything, who'd seen Jesus and who'd seen and heard Jesus up close. Um, and all the Gospels were complete uh, by the end of the first century. Um, and that's widely accepted in historical scholarship. The Gospels were then copied and distributed so that others could encounter Jesus. And of course, we're still doing that today. Translating the Gospels into uh, foreign languages uh, so that people can read about Jesus in their own tongue. I'll say a bit more about that uh, towards the end. But what about this other issue of, of canon? Which things, which writings were included and which were not? As, as soon as the true gospel began to be preached, there were false gospels. Paul, writing in Galatians, the very earliest letter refers to a false gospel brought by uh, Jewish teachers who said that the Gentiles had to keep the Jewish law. Uh, and most of Paul's letters address some heretical idea. Uh, and towards the end of the first century, there, there are signs of a heresy that would come to be called Gnosticism, that would plague the church for centuries. And uh, as you come into the second century, and uh, toward the middle, towards the end, there are alternative gospels appear. The Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Mary, obviously not written by those people, but using their names and claiming to have been uh, written by them, to uh, trying to give them legitimacy. And these later Gospels, or the Apocryphal Gospels as they're called, uh, were vehicles for these Gnostic ideas. They were never considered for inclusion in the canon of scripture. And uh, although the final sort of decision was made in 325 at the Council of Nicaea, the content of the Bible really had already been established much before then. The idea that comes out in the Da Vinci Code is that the Emperor Constantine is sitting there saying, oh, we'll have this one, not that one. And, you know, a bit of a random process. It wasn't like that at all. So these later so-called Gospels were, were rejected because they were later. They weren't connected to the uh, original Apostles. Um, they also presuppose the original Gospels because they focus on the gaps. They tell stories about Jesus' childhood. They claim to um, knowledge of what Jesus preached after his resurrection in those 40 days that the Bible tells us little about. Um, they kind of fill in the gaps, but by doing that, they assume uh, or they presuppose the original Gospels. Uh, crucially, they're very different kind of books. Um, the four Gospels tell a continuous story of, of a Jesus rooted in real history. <coughs> These other Gospels have little narrative. I don't really want to call them Gospels. These other writings um, have uh, no real narrative. They lift Jesus out of his historical context. 
they don't put Jesus in any connection with Israel um, and above all the teaching contradicts what we find in the four original Gospels. They are vehicles for the Gnostic heresy, they see it sees the problem as our captivity to our physical bodies rather than our slavery to sin. So for those reasons um, these uh, apocryphal Gospels uh, are not part of the Bible and uh, if it comes up in conversation uh, I hope you'll be able to say something about that. Uh, there's some good resources on the table at the back in order to browse some of those books that will tell you more about this kind of thing. So that's a little bit about how did we get the Bible and how it's come to be in its current form. But we still have to make the case um, that the, the Gospels are reliable historical documents. Can we trust the Bible? And there are two aspects to this uh, which I've underlined there. Firstly, do we have what the original authors wrote? And then secondly, were they telling the truth? So those are the two, two questions really. Do we have an accurate record of what the original authors wrote? Now that question arises because the original documents that were written on do not exist. Uh, they, it was written on perishable material that hasn't survived. We don't have it. Uh, and they call that, they call those original documents the autographs. The actual things that Paul and Mark and so on, everything that they actually wrote has not survived. But what we have are copies known as manuscripts from different places and different times. And by comparing these manuscripts, we can work our way back to what the original autographs said. So let me give you a simple illustration of that. If I put a letter on the screen and ask you all to copy it down, we would have what, 25, 30 copies of this uh, letter. Then if I delete the original, but I have all your copies, I'll be able to work out what the original said, because hopefully it will all be the same. Maybe one or two spelling mistakes, maybe someone leaves out a comma or a word falls out here or there, but you'd be able to work out what the original said from, from the copies. Now if I were, um, if you were then asked to send that letter, or you, rather your copy, to other family members and ask them to copy it down, then you'd have even more copies, wouldn't you? And, and the more copies you have, then inevitably the more discrepancies there might be. <coughs> spelling mistakes, omissions, maybe a, a word added in here or there. But the essential core of the letter would remain the same if you're doing the task diligently <laughs> you know, and uh, seeking to do it well. And that's basically what we're dealing with here with the New Testament. Uh, although we're talking about thousands of copies written over hundreds of years. So we don't have the originals, but we have handwritten copies with slight variations, as you'd expect given the number and their geographical spread. Now, compared with other classic texts from the ancient world, the New Testament is without peer. Quite simply, it is the best attested ancient document in the world. We have over 5,000 manuscripts in existence. Most ancient pieces of literature have about 20 copies. By the there are 5,000. Uh, the earliest one is a fragment from John's Gospel dating back to the early 2nd century. It's, you can see it in the John Rylands Library in Manchester. The average classical writer has no copies of his work for about 500 years. There's a 500 year gap from the, per the time the person lived to the earliest manuscript. We can go right back to within a generation of the apostles. Um, we've got 15 complete manuscripts dating back to the late second century. By AD 400, we have over 100 manuscripts. So in terms of age and quantity, the New Testament 
as the arrival. So do we have what the original authors wrote? Yes, because of the number and the quality of the manuscripts. And that's not to mention all the translations um, that exist in Syrian and Arabic and Armenian, as well as um, quotations in the early church fathers. Some people get worried about the discrepancies. My response is, well, how could they not be? Of course, there's a few differences. Uh, and most are accidental and trivial. Spelling errors, omissions and additions, grammatical changes, but nothing major. No important doctrine hinges on a disputed verse. And where there are discrepancies, your Bible will tell you in the footnotes. If you ever do any serious Bible study and... and and uh, if you read the very small print down the bottom, it will tell you that there are alternative readings in, in different manuscripts. So there's nothing hidden, you know, the, 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 nothing's being covered up here. The two biggest conundrums, there's a passage at the end of Mark's Gospel, and the story of the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8, which are not found in the earliest manuscripts. I, all we need to do is just note that that is the case. Uh, um, personally, I, I don't preach on the end of Mark, um, and I wouldn't base any doctrine exclusively on, on either of those passages. But we just have to acknowledge that. They're, they're not there in the oldest manuscripts, but they are probably authentic and have just been added on later. But we can be 99.9% .9 certain that what we read in our modern translations is a faithful reproduction of what the original authors actually wrote. But that still leaves the second question. Were they telling the truth? You see, we may have an accurate record of the original documents, but those original documents may have been made up. They may not be telling the truth. Maybe we have an accurate record of things that never actually happened. Now, how do we address that? Well, there's external evidence and there's internal evidence. External evidence, things like archaeology, the science of rubbish, as it's called. Um, <clears throat> various um, finds, Archaeological discoveries have reinforced the Gospels as reliable historical accounts. For example, John, the author of the fourth Gospel, has an intimate knowledge of Jerusalem. It is, John's Gospel is, it all takes place in Jerusalem, uh, or most of it. And John has an intimate knowledge of the city. And time and again, archaeology has vindicated the Bible by unearthing the Pool of Bethesda, Solomon's Colonnade, and in 2005, the Pool of Siloam. Places that are referred to in the Gospels that were thought to have been made up, and then archaeological discoveries proved that uh, John was telling the truth. Uh, Luke wrote the Gospel and the Book of Acts, and he's been shown consistently to be a reliable historian. His, his knowledge of Roman um, governors, specific Roman governors and their titles, has been shown to be correct. We don't have independent verification for every place and event. But since the Bible has been proved accurate on so many matters, surely we should give it the benefit of the doubt. We should assume it's reliable unless there is evidence to the contrary. And I think as Gordon mentioned, what we have in the Bible is a very good fit for what we do know about the ancient world. And for the professional historians, that counts more than anything. The Jesus we read about <coughs> is consistent with our historical knowledge. So the Gospels speak about a world that isn't like Middle Earth. It's not a galaxy far, far away. It's a world that's very familiar to ancient historians. That the political and religious context that it describes is accurate. The world of Roman domination and Jewish opposition and the different Jewish groups like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the significance of the temple and pilgrimage to Jerusalem, the importance of the Jewish law. All, all these things fit what we know 
about the ancient world um, from other sources. The geography is accurate, as are, as are the references to messianic hopes and the role of John the Baptist. The Gospels then are generally regarded as reliable historical sources for our information about Jesus. And I'm glad to say that scepticism that dominated biblical scholarship for 200 years, well up until well into the 20th century, is now in full retreat. And that's a good thing. So there's external evidence, but there's also internal evidence. That is within the Bible itself. There's all the little eyewitness details that reinforce its credibility. The specific um, details in uh, the Gospels that could only have come from somebody who was there, an eyewitness, noticing that the grass is green or there are 153 fish, and, you know, that kind of thing. <coughs> sort of details that you couldn't just make up. The writers claim to be telling the truth. We should at least give them the benefit of the doubt. But ultimately the answer to, to that, this question, were they telling the truth, is a value judgment. That is something that we as readers have to decide <clears throat> if they were telling the truth in every detail or not. And our decision will probably be due to other factors, such as do we actually believe there's a God who can intervene in history? But in the end, I want to say to someone that proof is in the pudding. It is through the written word of God that people encounter the living word, Jesus Christ himself. Jesus comes to us clothed in his word. That's a phrase I use a lot. The Jesus that we can know and encounter comes to us through the book. He comes clothed in his word. And so my response to the sceptic who doubts the Bible is to invite them to read it with me. Say, okay, let's, let's encounter, let's find out together about Jesus. Because God promises that, that his word is living and active. We're invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. Jesus says, seek and you will find. It's a real promise of encounter. Yes, the Bible is a trustworthy and reliable historical document. And hopefully I've said some things this morning that will just point you uh, in the direction of being able to address those questions. But the purpose of the Bible is to lead us to Jesus. All the scriptures testify to him. And so next time, we're actually going to focus on the person of Jesus himself. We've cleared away the rubbish, um, or the rubbish.